everybody. Welcome to NASM Performance. We are now live for our latest edition of Beyond the Abstract with Dr. G. And today we have a very special guest too, which I can't wait to announce. Uh, let's go ahead and see if we can get Guillermo on the line as well as our guest. Good morning. How's it going? Pretty good about you. Good. I got to move myself here. I'm a little out of frame, I think, now. Um, so I'll, I'll see what I can do. But uh, yeah, really excited for our uh, episode today, Beyond the Abstracts, number 16, believe it or not. Can't believe it. Uh, and today's a really, uh, really special one because we have a guest joining us. I don't think we've had a guest on since Dr. Shai Kvyat's Coves. Uh, Kv Kvyatkovsky, gosh, sorry, Shy. It's always a, a tongue twister with your name there. Uh, we went uh, when we went over all things collagen. So uh, today's episode is really cool, and uh, I'm excited for our guest. Let's see if we can bring him in. There he is. There he is. What's up? Guys? Hello, Nick. Dr. Nick, how are you? <laughs> just, just Nick, and you know, you're looking extra slow right now. <laughs> I did an extra set of bicep curls this morning. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. All right. I should have done a pre Instagram live pump. Tune <laughs> in to this edition of Beyond the Abstract, this episode number 16. We have a very special guest joining us today, Dr. Nick Rolnick, AKA Panic. So, much us for Yeah, no, thanks, thanks guys. I, uh, I always welcome the opportunity to discuss all things BFR, strength and conditioning, and muscle building. I think those are all, uh, those basically encompass all my, uh, my interests. Uh, Thank you for having me. I already on what we might be getting into today, but um, for those of you tuning in, I'm familiar with Dr. Nick, who's leading us. He had a recent review paper um, published. It was back in March, earlier this year, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Tony, Tony, you're cutting out a little bit. For some reason, you're, you're, we can't hear you very well. Can you hear me now? Now we can, yeah. All right. Yeah, I was okay. Um, so let me, uh, let me start over then. So today we're pleased to have Dr. Nick Rolnick, um, who is one of the world's leading experts in blood flow restriction training. Uh, he was also a contributor to our physique and body coach program. Um, so... Yeah, we're really, uh, really thrilled that you're on, Nick, and can't wait to get into uh, into the discussion today. Uh, one thing I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later is the recent paper you had published back in March, uh, which was looking at uh, a review of the current research on on blood flow restriction training. And uh, I'm excited for you to share some some insights and findings from that. So, without we'll go ahead and get into it. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of, you know, your backgrounds, your uh, uh, DPT, is that correct? Yeah, so I am a physical therapist and a personal trainer. I, I actually say that I'm a, I'm a personal trainer that's a physical therapist um, because for me, exercise has always been a frontline uh, intervention and more so recently given you know, 70% of the population right now is overweight and or obese. And there's nothing that can impact our own genes and optimize our function like exercise. Um, so it really is a, an important part of what I do and how I believe we should be 
moving on a day-to-day -day basis and blood flow restriction is just a small albeit i guess significant in some aspects ways that i can help keep people moving even when they're injured um, and giving them the benefits of heavy lifting awesome so some of us may be familiar with with bfr blood restriction can you briefly describe the history of it and how it originated, what populations it may have been, and then how that perhaps evolved. And uh, we've learned a little bit more about the wide variety of. Uh, yeah. So, just Guillermo, is he still cutting out on your end? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure why. Yeah, I think I think what he's asking is that look, can you describe a little bit of the history of the, of the BFR uh, a little bit, and then maybe just explain what BFR is, because I know maybe some of our audience doesn't specifically know. Uh, what BFR is specifically? Yeah, uh, well, legend legend had it that uh, Yoshiaki Sato, uh, older so, in a, a Buddhist temple kneeling down, and he started to feel this burn, and this is in the mid-60s, started to feel this burn in his calves like he was getting a pump. And he then had the bright idea to say, oh, let me just start occluding my blood flow to the limb and do exercise with it. And, you know, he or, or so has been told through, you know, his recollection or whatever his public, you know, story is that he started to experiment with restricting blood flow to you know, his limbs and exercising and noticed that um, he was able to, in, in one of his injuries, be able to recover faster um, and ultimately kind of created what is now known as katsu training or added pressure training in Japanese. And that, you know, evolution took decades uh, of, of a lot of practice and started to get into research. But the effects or the, the interest in ischemia or reduced oxygen concentrations in a limb has been something that exercise physiologists have looked at for, you know, in some way, shape or form for like, a, for like 100 years. But recently, it's been applied, I think the earliest paper that's specifically using vascular strength training, which you know, I guess this is the time to kind of talk about BFR in and of itself, where you're using some sort of device to apply it to the proximal most portion of your limb. And in doing so, it reduces blood flow that's flowing to the extremity. And you're creating partial arterial restriction. So blood flow is still able to get into the exercising limb, but you're creating full venous occlusion. So blood isn't able to at least theoretically escape. And that creates a, an environment to simplify it that basically stimulates high intensity strength training. So you're able to, with little loads and the loads that are really recommended are between 20 and 30% of your one repetition maximum. Whereas normal traditional strength training of moderate to high intensities of 60 plus percent of the one repetition maximum are commonly recommended to improve muscle mass and strength in, um, in practice. So we're able to lower that threshold um, for, for people. And that has a lot of relevancy for how um, we can approach strength training, both in the injured populations that can't lift heavy due to either a contraindication to do so from surgery or whatnot, or if they have pain that is preventing them from lifting. And that's a really cool opportunity for us as practitioners to be able to keep people moving but the earliest that i can that i found is a paper by shinaharo in 1998 to look at the effects of vascular strength training on strength um, but since then there have been hundreds of papers that have been published on blood flow restriction in a variety of different domains it started a lot in healthy people and then now it's expanded more and more into clinical type populations where um, where people are load compromised. Uh, now, Nick, I, I had a just a curious question on this history. The uh, the the OG for for constant training 
uh, was did he did he restrict the uh, the the limb uh, above the like you're supposed to on the proximal area or or did he do it more distally on on the limb? I don't know. You know that's that? a that's a that's a good question. I think I, I don't know. Um, I actually don't know if he wrote that. So he wrote a paper that was published in the International Journal of Katsu Training or Katsu, some, some Katsu-based journal where, you know, in 2005, he kind of recollected the evolution of Katsu training. And I can't remember if he wrote that where he applied the actual, um, where he applied the actual band, but convention is applying the band at the proximal most part of the limb because we have the most protection from a from neuro the neurovascular structures proximally and when we go distally so for example on the elbow we can create an ulnar nerve issue because the ulnar nerve is kind of right over here and so if we we restrict if we're doing forearm exercise we're we, we are at risk of damaging that nerve and if we're restricting at the calf we have the superficial fibular nerve at, that is right there wraps around the head of the fibula and that could create a foot drop um so you know or a common peroneal nerve that wraps around um my anatomy nerd would, would geek out and say that's yeah, and then it branches <laughs> off but anyway <laughs> um yeah so the convention is is applying proximally because we it's all the same plumb right if we restrict if we restrict proximally we're still going to get an effect of blood flow restriction uh whether we, we whether with with at least you know safer um application parameters because now we're we're not um as close to the neurovasculature Awesome, awesome. And you touched a little bit on who can benefit from blood flow restriction training, but I just wanted to highlight what you said, which is it's not just for clinical people, it is not just for, for healthy people, it's really a broad spectrum of individuals uh, that can actually benefit from blood flow restriction training. Uh, uh, and and am I, am I, did I highlight that correctly? Yeah, I think, I think you know, how I, how I approach blood flow restriction is we have to understand at least to, to, to the best of our knowledge, how normal strength training works. If we understand how normal strength training works, then we can fit BFR into that training paradigm. And, and so it makes a lot of sense that if we take the view that if we are lifting with heavy weights, right, which is traditionally the recommended uh, approach, that we're moving, our, our, our ability to shorten our muscle is already inhibited because the weight is too heavy. So the only way that we can really get to that same level of, of muscle contraction speed, which is really the driver when, when effort is maximal to stimulate muscle growth, that we need to induce fatigue. And BFR just accelerates that fatigue process. So I say that as a background because BFR is not doing anything super special when we talk about muscle growth. We can apply it in healthy people. We can apply it in injured people. It just so happens that injured people by, by far do not have the capacity to lift moderate to heavy weights and, are, and as such are relegated to suboptimal ways of stimulating muscle hypertrophy. And the reason why we stimulate muscle hypertrophy and we need to stimulate muscle hypertrophy is because muscle is, a, is an endocrine organ. Right? It's, it secretes these molecules called myokines or exokines, and these are, play a large role in regulating or, or stimulating adaptation, but at the same time, help regulate the systemic inflammation of our body. So if we have chronic lifestyle you know, type conditions like obesity, hypertension, et cetera, we want to minimize that, that inflammation and having more muscle allows us to do that. And when we're injured, Unfortunately, muscle is one of the first things that goes. Um, we tend to, if you're sedentary, you're, you're good on one day. But when we start to get to two, three days of really not moving, like if you're immobilized, for example, that definitely will exacerbate that. We start to see losses in muscle tissue that can be visualized via imaging, imaging like magnetic resonance and, uh, imaging, like MRIs. Um, and so it's our, our job is, as clinicians for, from the physical therapy side 
and even a personal training side, because if you're working with people that tend that are injured, but are still coming to see you, um, working with them, understanding that muscle mass is a huge, huge, huge organ that we as fitness and those that are watching that are, that are in healthcare providers, that we have control over. And so if we can understand how we can push our clients to the level of exertion required that will likely stimulate those adaptations, that in and of itself is the best thing that we can do. So you can apply BFR in healthy individuals, you can apply it in injured. In fact, I do think that while the adaptation profile of BFR and heavy lifting are likely identical on the molecular signaling level for the most part, and we get the same adaptations. I am very interested recently in the potential for BFR and aerobic exercise to actually get us beyond what would be experienced in normal high intensity work, which is very unique. And that's definitely an area that I'd like to see explored more in the body of research. So that's a very long winded answer for you but hopefully it provides some context to the people that are watching no awesome that's great now one, one question that i always have is if do you need uh the, the expensive equipment because i know some of your can, can run pretty pricey uh and then of course you can you can go as, as cheap as like using knee wraps and then there's everything kind of in between um you know uh, you as the bfr expert and, and by the way i i took your course you know when you when you did it and it was it was a fantastic course i actually learned a lot about bfr training because it's something that i had utilized but uh i had never uh, really implemented it, uh you know a, a lot so it, it was it, it's a great course if uh, those of you guys that want to get educated in that i, I would encourage that uh, shameless but, plug thank you so much <laughs> well that was it was it was actually just uh you know really just uh, legitimate because i, I it, there's a lot of good information in there but one of the things i, I often ask is you know what what do you equipment wise you know what what are the risks and benefits of using some of the cheaper stuff or the more expensive stuff so that's a loaded question only because so my position in the industry and why i'm i, I feel and what people have told me that I'm a trusted resource is I don't have any investment in any particular cuff company. Um, I'm purely about spreading the science of blood flow restriction and understanding and improving upon our, understand, our, our, our knowledge of blood flow restriction. So with that being said, um, I think that there is, I think that there is, when you're working with people as a physical therapist, for a medical provider. I think there is a, a very important um, uh, responsibility that we should be using devices that offer more precision. And the way that we do that in practice, and, and unfortunately, this is in and of itself a Pandora's box, which we can talk about if, if, if we wanted to go into that but the the idea is that we want to make sure that we are applying a subocclusive pressure to the individual that we're working with meaning that it, like if you like the easiest thing when i explain this to my my clients or patients it's hey um have you ever gotten your blood pressure taken i'm sure you have because you're here so definitely at some point in your life you've gotten your blood pressure taken well what we're going to do is we're going to pump this this device up at basically like getting your blood pressure taken and we're going to work at a pressure that's less than that and typically the pressures tend to be between 50 and 80 percent of the pressure needed to completely restrict your blood flow and what we do know is, is that by far and large, we probably only need a moderate level of pressure. By moderate, it means 50 to 60%. We don't necessarily need high amounts of pressure. And high amounts of pressure induce more discomfort and thus might reduce the compliance overall from a long-term training program. So I say that because when we're working with people that are, are when we're working with people that are medically compromised, we want to make sure that we're offering a more precise stimulus. So any device that we that you can use to create a more precise um, application of blood flow restriction is likely ideal. Now there are very expensive devices, and for me, as being somebody that people supply me with devices, or I'm able to get them at less you know cost, 
Um, I use more expensive devices typically in my own practice because they're, they have the bells and whistles and I'm able to be more precise. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're inherently safer. Um, I think that as long as we're able to stick to recommended guidelines, that we can uh, optimize safe practice of BFR regardless of whatever equipment that we're using. But typically when people ask me, I tend to say, hey, you might need to buy a little bit more expensive cups and they vary um, depending on your, you know, your budget, your patient population, and whether or not you, you know, really feel your, your comfortability with the science of BFR. Um, so I think that when you're working with clinic, uh, in the clinic or if you're a physical therapist, athletic trainer, we're just working with people that, that are under your care from a clinical perspective, I think you need to be a little bit more precise to minimize your liability. But on the flip side, when you're working in the fitness, um, when you're working in the fitness uh, industry and you're working with people that are generally healthy, I think we can be a little bit less precise. Uh, what we currently know about the research is that we do need a minimum amount of pressure likely to accelerate the fatigue process, which is gonna give us the benefits over low intensity exercise. Um, so I do think that there is, you know, always the, the, the notion that, yeah, we should have these devices and they're getting a little bit less expensive, but do I think that you need a very, very, very expensive device? Probably not. Um, but I don't recommend practical BFR uh, in the sense that we do have research that says that we can over or underestimate the amount of pressure that we're putting on our limb. And for us, you know, for me, that can either be working with less effective pressure, meaning we're not giving enough pressure, or we're applying a high amount of pressure that might even be super occlusive, which would increase the likelihood of um, an adverse event. Even though, full disclosure, I think BFR is extremely safe. Uh, in fact, you know, when I was at um, uh, the NSCA conference in July, I presented that it basically, if you are safe to exercise, you are safe to perform BFR. Um, and, and so that's the caveat we're saying, hey, listen, what is your risk tolerance? Um, even though we know practical BFR works, I as a practitioner would probably wanna have a device where I have some idea of the amount of pressure that's being applied to the limb. And with that being said, one of the projects that I was involved in was estimating if we didn't have something that could, man that could automatically calculate that pressure, right? What could we use as a surrogate that would likely put us within the range to apply BFR safely? And so we looked at cups between nine and 13 centimeters, which is typical width, like four inches or so of cups that you would purchase, you know, a manual cup that you can you know, pump up or even a you know, worst case scenario, a blood pressure cuff. Um, but that you basically can pump it up to this value and, and basically be within an acceptable range of subocclusive pressure. And so what we found was that in our analysis, that if you take 1.3 times your brachial systolic blood pressure, that tends to be a good estimation of 100% of your limb occlusion pressure if you're using a cuff between 9 and 14 centimeters. Brachial systolic blood pressure, so just your blood pressure value alone, tends to be a good estimate for around 80%, which would be the upper limit of what I would recommend for use in the lower body, for example. Um, upper body tends to be around 50%. And then we found that, no lie, just using 100 millimeters of mercury, so just pumping it up to 100, is about a good estimate for 60% of the limb occlusion pressure which really means that for the, for, and for me as, a, as somebody who um, understands the, the, how painful, because it's, it's not comfortable, 80% is, and knowing that we can exercise at a little bit lower pressures to be able to get the same effect, I usually exercise my clients and patients at around 60% anyways. So it's actually a really nice way that you can say, hey, listen, 100 millimeters of mercury, if you don't have something like a Doppler, where if you buy a cup, you can probably get a good a manual cup set for around $200, um, but, but you need a Doppler. And a Doppler takes some skill, and it's, it's very difficult practically. So coming up with strategies to make BFR more accessible that are also evidence-based 
is really, really, really important for me as I'm trying to kind of give bumpers to the growth of BFR as it permeates into fitness settings, such as um, NASM certified trainers. Awesome. That, that kind of leads into the next question, because uh, the, the, the article that you published uh, was basically looking at the uh, beneath the cup, the o overlooked and underreported Buffalo restriction device features and their impact on practice. So with regards to that, uh, you know, one, one question that I have is when you're looking at the BFR research and reading the literature, because there's a lot of it, especially in the last few years, what are some important research design characteristics and features associated with the BFR application that can impact the, the responses that you see uh, and the safety profile with the BFR exercise? Yeah, um, so that paper, for those that are interested, that is like, if, if normal BFR talk is here, it's beneath, it's in the weeds um, of BFR. And that's only because I have a very good uh, familiarity with all the different features that different cuffs can have and, and try to question whether or not the features that these cuffs have are more marketing or are they truly based in science? And so when I read BFR papers, I think of a couple of things. Number one, did they apply it according to guidelines? And guidelines are typically between 20 and 30% of the one repetition maximum. And there's two common rec commonly recommended repetition profiles that are used, uh, which are four sets of one first set of 30 reps followed by three sets of 15 or sets to failure. And they're gonna give us a couple of different um, avenues to explore in terms of interpretation of what they do but and real um, quick but so i look nick with regards to that what's the rest period between those sets uh because uh, typically it's 30 to 60 seconds is that correct yep. yeah typically 30 to 60 seconds and they're pretty painful um uh, because you're just if you can imagine the the last couple of reps of a, of a moderate uh lifting set where you're accumulating some metabolites you know you're within that 10 to 12 rep range and you're feeling that burn, well, that burn gets trapped inside of the muscle. So you're just sitting there, just stewing in that burn. And that's really um, where it can get pretty uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, for me, it's, it's really, do they, do they follow guidelines, right? So lower intensity exercise with, um, or lower load exercise with resistance exercise between 20 and 30% of the one rep max and lower intensity aerobic exercise, typically between, uh, less than 50% of the VO2, um, VO2 max. So it's pretty, pretty low intensity. And how is it applied, right? Are they using an individualized pressure? Because what we know is if I apply the same pressure on, you know, you know, on you as I do with me, we might be at, at a relatively different percentage of LOP. Um, I'm knowing that I just said this, basically saying that 100 millimeters of mercury is good, so it's kind of hypocritical, but that is the, the, the common notion of, all right, well, we know that based, that limb occlusion pressure is gonna vary based on three things. It's gonna be very based largely on how big the limb is, what your blood pressure is and how wide the cuff that you're using is. So if we typically are standardizing the cuff width when we're doing a BFR intervention, then really the only two other variables are going to be the cuff width, uh, the limb circumference and the blood pressure. Um, so typically like individualizing the pressure accommodates all of those different factors. So that's the most precise way to do it. Um, but there are obviously less precise ways. I just mentioned that before with the 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, and then how is it applied? Is it applied throughout the, the, the whole exercise or is it deflated during the exercise, which is, which, which is a possible application of BFR. It's called resting BFR. When the, when the individual exercises, then you pump up the cuff at the end and you trap those metabolites that have been produced, but you're not doing it during exercise or are, is it only inflated during the exercise and deflated during the rest? That would be called intermittent BFR. But looking at how that protocol is then designed is important. And then obviously, I'm a very big 
advocate that BFR is just like normal strength training, except we're accelerating that fatigue from accumulating at lower loads. So I want the BFR to be done in a prescription that mimics what would normally be done with unrestricted exercise. So two to three times per week is my bare minimum for the BFR efficacy. If they do once a week, not really, um, not really something that I would take any stock in given that it's not frequent enough. And then the last bit would be volume, right? Uh, real, Are they hitting- Real, real quick, Nick, I had one question with regards to that that was very interesting. Um, with regards to that, that two or three days per week, you're talking about the research design, but if I'm implementing it, let's say as part of an overall strength and conditioning program, I, I could do BFR say one day a week and then maybe do more traditional strength training another, another three days per week, right? So you're talking about the yeah. research design. Yeah, I'm talking about research. So, so normal, like normal BFR application. If you're using BFR once a week and you're you're predominantly lifting moderate to heavy weights, you're going to have a similar repeated bout effect for that's going to preserve, kind of allow you to continue the positive adaptation because there's it's protection, right? And so, if you're just doing BFR once a week, that's fine. Um, especially when you're doing it in conjunction with moderate heavy lifting. But typically the research design is looking at exclusively BFR compared to some other intervention. Right. Um, but, but yeah, there's definitely, and there's definitely other areas of BFR that have been looked at. Like there's this, there's this thought that because BFR is so low intensity that you can perform it very frequently. And so, that was interesting to me uh, because it's commonly recommended. So me and my colleague in Brazil, we did a scoping review looking at the whole body of literature on what we call high frequency BFR, where you can apply BFR one to two times per day for you know anywhere from five to 12 sessions a week. And, and the thought in there is you're able to stimulate and, and create those adaptations on a much quicker time scale than what would normally be expected. And what we found was BFR tends to work, right, statistically, but when you actually critique the, um, the BFR methodology like we just talked about, and you critique the statistical analyses that were used, it's very low level evidence. And so what we basically said was, it works clearly, but we need a lot more evidence to really support that because that would also be a unique effect of, of BFR is if we can stimulate adaptations quicker than moderate to heavy lifting. Um, that would be interesting. But what we actually found was, and, and I came up with 27 different limitations uh, and questions in the high frequency BFR uh, literature. Um, so we're quite a while away from from kind of definitively stating that that kind of thing works. But yeah, these are all types of, of ways in which BFR has been applied. And that's not even including studies now that are looking at pairing that with high intensity exercise, like right. resistance exercise, which doesn't really make sense to me. And the research really is, is more favoring my bias than, oh, it adds or high intensity interval training or high intensity aerobic training and looking at the ability of, of BFR to increase VO2 max and potentially increase lactate threshold so that those individuals can work at a higher intensity and a higher relative intensity, um, which has a huge potential performance enhancement beyond just traditional high intensity exercise. And that's the area that I mentioned before, I'm really looking forward to for uh, future research, but uh, Nick, yeah. in, in, what, in your introduction to this paper that you, uh, that you wrote, uh, you, you actually highlighted one study that actually looked at traditional BFR using that 20 to 30% uh, load. And then there was another group that did uh, the traditional strength training, but they, they used a traditional loading with the BFR and then they compared it to the traditional training uh, alone without the, without the BFR. And what was interesting is obviously uh, strength gains was was actually higher in the, the group that did the traditional strength training protocol with the BFR uh, and, and compared to even the, the one that was just a traditional strength training. So I, I thought that was a pretty interesting study that you, you guys discussed briefly in your introduction. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, 
you know, for me, I, I just try to have a, you know, be aware of the overall body of, of evidence and try to have a model where we fit into wherever these papers kind of come into play. I know, I think you're, what you're talking about was one of the studies that looked at collegiate high school football players. And what they did was they added BFR to a high intensity after. So they did high intensity exercise and then they did BFR as a supplement. And so basically what they were seeing in that study is we got a ton of questions by the way on the in the chat um but what they saw was an improvement in strength and in the group that did the supplemental bfr now my question when i look at that kind of research is 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 that a unique effect of bfr or is that because they just in general were able to get more volume and thus more muscle contraction in a specific pattern which because typically they tend to test, you know, they test, they, they basically, you know, Dr. Lenicky, um, out of Ole Miss, um, he, he kind of is a really spearheading this. It's like, you can't train for the test. Like you're doing back squats and you're doing back squats at 30%, but you're doing back squats at 80%. Of course, the 80% is going to give you superior benefit, uh, in terms of strength because strength is specific. Right, you're, you're, you adopt a more hip dominant pattern when you're lifting heavy than when you do when you're lifting light. And so it's like, you know, these are all things to, to consider with the application. But yeah, um, the paper, the beneath the cuff paper is, was kind of like my, 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 sec, my third like paper that I really wanted to get out there because it's not really discussed as much, that much where we're talking about restricting blood flow but there, the, the paper discusses different features that blood flow restriction devices can have and hypothesizes about their relevancy. And we kind of take in different studies that have been used uh, to investigate these, um, these features or talk about the potential for them to improve compliance by decreasing discomfort and so it kind of gets really in the weeds, but I think the, the two most relevant features that we discuss in that article is the presence of auto regulation of applied pressure and the different bladder types. So typically, um, typically for uh, auto regulation, there is a device that is paired that's computer operated that basically creates a pressure around the limb that's relatively, or what we think is relatively consistent. So when we squeeze our, like if we're doing a bicep curl, then the cuff will dump out air to allow for the, the pressure underneath the cuff to be maintained. And then as we go into the eccentric, the cuff pressure will increase. So we're getting a relatively uniform pressure around the limb in a circumferential nature. Um, and so that's been marketed time and time again as being something that's safer to be able to use. And, and I have always questioned that because we were being told by device manufacturers that this is safer, but then there's really only been one study that's, that's been done that you, that kind of investigated the presence of auto regulation and its, and its potential impact on, how hard the exercise was, how uncomfortable it was, what was the blood pressure response and things like that. So that kind of spurred my interest in exploring this in, in a clinical trial basis. And then we talked about two of the trials that I was involved in that had contrasting results, which again, kind of gets into the weeds because just because a cuff can regulate the pressure doesn't necessarily mean that all cuffs regulate the pressure the same. The responsiveness of that auto regulation is going to dictate the performance and acute and the perceptual. So how uncomfortable it is, how hard you're working. Um, so that was kind of discussing that. And we have many more studies that are coming out that help design that are going to look and dissect this area a little bit more closely. And then we have another section called with, that we discussed with, with multi-chambered bladder systems. So anybody watching, 
these multi-chamber bladder systems are not tourniquets. So when we apply BFR, we are in essence applying a tourniquet to an exercising limb. And, and, and that has a purpose. The purpose is reducing arterial inflow and occluding the venous return. These cups, the multi-chamber bladder cups, are designed to not occlude blood flow at all because these little pockets of air are pressed down and it's, it's while it's around the limb it's not circumferential and there's areas where the skin can expand into the divots between the different bladders so we're never able to reliably restrict blood flow yet the companies that produce these devices are marketing claims that they're just as effective as tourniquet based or single chamber bladder system cuffs and that really annoys me because when we looked at the totality of evidence, um, there's only been a select handful of papers that have actually implemented this multi-chamber bladder system. And none of them help us understand whether or not it's actually the multi-chamber bladder system that's causing the benefit or the fact that they just exercise to volitional fatigue in one in one side. We know that BFR acts exactly like low intensity training, except it accelerates the fatigue from accumulating. So I designed another study that's coming out, um, it's in review, that should help, um, you know, it challenges my biases, I would say, that right now, um, but it should be coming out in the next month or so. Um, and that's really kind of what I'm about, is just, I, I wanna separate the, what's marketing from what's the science, and I will follow whatever the science says, because ultimately I've seen BFR change lives. I've seen it change physiques. I've seen, you know, it really push, uh, push our understanding of exercise physiology forward. Um, but those are really the two areas that, that we discussed that, that are largely, I would say, relevant to, um, you know, to practitioners looking to implement BFR. Awesome, I think Tony, we have a lot of questions. I think we've we've had a a good amount of uh, responses here. So you want to maybe look at some of those and see where we where we go now. Can you hear me? It's a little a little choppy still. Weird. Weird. Yeah, I'm sorry, everyone. Anything anybody for now? As I like get super close. <laughs> if you get a little closer, it actually does help. But we uh, only get to see your nose, but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did have a question earlier, actually, and Nick, you did address it. You know the difference between auto-regulated versus not. Uh, um, and I'm a good lip reader, so I said auto-regulated versus not auto-regulated, and which one do you prefer personally? Um, um, listen, I think that if we have the if you have the budget to purchase an auto-regulated device, I don't think that it hurts right like um to give you an example uh and not to go too far down the rabbit hole but the two studies that we published um so far showed relatively a little bit contrasting results and one study used the smart cuffs generation three auto regulation which their auto regulation isn't as tight so the cuff wasn't able to yeah you know, when you contract there's a large deficit so blood flow is able to kind of come in at least that's what we theorized and what we showed in that one was you can do more work with an auto-regulated cuff than without that with that same cuff right but now not auto-regulated and so i was like okay well that's one thing and, and it was less uncomfortable than the auto than the non-auto regulated so it's like all right well let me let, let's go and let's try the five thousand dollar device right and and see how if those those similar trends persist and what we found was with a more responsive device that really tightly regulates the pressure applied to the limb we found no difference in in exercise to fatigue in terms of repetitions performed and in terms of perceptual, so how uncomfortable it was and how, um, and how hard the exercise was, we found no difference. So, so that to me says that there's something either with the exercise that we chose, which was wall squat, and the one that we did in the, with the smart cuffs was a leg extension, 
So maybe it has a byproduct of the exercise. I doubt it though. My personal experience with both is that, you know, the, the, this kind of parceled out to exactly how I was thinking it was going to parcel out to. Um, but do I, but what we did find though, actually, which really blew my mind, um, was that we measured arterial stiffness in the aorta. So a lot of the times, we, we, we think that, oh, we're measuring our blood pressure at our arm or our leg, right? Typically it's the arm. And that's going to be reflective of everything that's happening inside. And that's not necessarily the case. When we looked at central stiffness, so the stiffness after exercise, right? It tends to, it, it tends to increase in exercise, particularly with resistance exercise. And there tends to be no effect or less effect when we use aerobic exercise. But nonetheless, both of them have a, have a way to adapt or create adaptation to our central arterial apparatus, which ultimately makes us a little bit healthier, right, in the grand scheme of things. Um, what we found was that auto-regulated application blunted the, what we call the pulse wave velocity. So it's a measure of arterial stiffness mm -hmm. relative to non-auto-regulated non -auto and low intensity strength training, which kind of doesn't make sense to me, um, but that's what we found. Um, suggesting that there might be a small protective effect of using a tightly regulated uh, device for central arterial stiffness. But, oh, but that being said, we have no idea because we looked what what the acute increase in central stiffness actually means from a safety perspective. We know that about one meter per second is an increase in that in the measure that we were looking at is associated with all cause morbidity and mortality. But we found that there was no increase in central stiffness acutely in the auto regulated condition, but there was a 0.6 meter per second increase in the non auto regulated and the a low intensity exercise condition. So in the grand scheme of things, I just say, if you are applying BFR to recommended guidelines, you should be all good in terms of safe application. Um, and if you're not, well, then you're risking, you know, you're risking some uh, adverse events from happening that could probably have been preventable. I love it. Nick, you're, you're a wealth of knowledge in, in BFR, man. I, I love it. I, I love your passion. You, you can just hear how much uh, you know, knowledge you have in it. And, and really, uh, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing in this field because it, it really uh, is an area that needs to be explored. I know uh, um, I, I didn't really use VFR a lot until uh, after, uh, actually after I took your course, I started implementing it periodically, which was pretty cool. Um, and uh, I, I've really enjoyed it. I think to me, one of the challenging things is, uh, or at least initially was getting through my head that a 20 to 30 percent of your one rm load is enough for for a stimulus and uh you know it's one of those things where you know i remember i was doing a leg press and i'm like what am i doing with i don't know 250 300 pounds on the leg press it's not it's light um mm -hmm. but when you put that cup on there it is absolutely brutal um especially you know that first set of 30 like you feel it but then you get that second, third, or fourth, and it, I mean, and that feeling is uh, not at all pleasurable. <laughs> no, and that's and that really, to me, is is like okay, we know BFR works, right, in a variety of applications. So whether or not you want to do practical BFR and you want to wrap your arm with powerlifting straps, because that's really what I was doing when I first started it. Like a bodybuilder, I saw in the gym. This is back in like two thousand and. 2012 ish 2013 and i was prepping for a show and i was like i was kind of getting beat up because i was still of the high volume mentality and i was like oh what is that that's weird and then the bodybuilder was like oh it's occlusion training and like you're able to get a massive pump and you know build your muscles and so i was like all right sign me up uh and and so i tried it and it was, you know, it was one of those things that the setup was difficult with practical BFR. Like it was just, it was one of those things I tried for a couple of weeks. I was like, nah, I'm just going to go back until the technology kind of caught up. And then I started to, it started to become a lot more feasible to do it, particularly in the upper body. Lower body is never that problem, never a problem. Um, but it's more like for me, biceps, forearms, 
um, were, were how I was really applying it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all, I'm all about minimizing discomfort associated with, with BFR because if, if it, we already know if, if you push yourself, it's going to be uncomfortable. But my interest is how can we mitigate that amount of discomfort so we are at the baseline or what we would expect the minimum amount of discomfort to be given this application of, of BFR. So any way that we can mitigate that while creating a similar um, benefit to exercise is something I'm very highly interested in. Uh, now, Nick, I I think I want to, uh, we've been here a long time, usually a little longer than, than normally. We've had a lot, a lot of fun, but I wanted to get one thing is I saw somebody that wants to order the Amazon cups. I, I don't think that we're necessarily advocating those uh, for the- Yeah, uh, and they're not that good. I've tried them. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I pride myself on understanding what's out in the market. You're, you're, by purchasing a $20 booty band, uh, what they call them, like you're really not going to get the, the effect of true BFR, you'll get some minor effect, I'd imagine, but really it's important to apply a minimum level of pressure. So it's really, you're gonna have to invest a couple hundred bucks to do so, but these cups, particularly the ones that are a couple hundred bucks, um, the majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them, particularly the ones you have to pump up yourself, are pretty resilient um, to, to use. And as I, as I mentioned before, you don't necessarily need additional technology. You can order the cups and you can just pump it up to 100 millimeters of mercury and know that you're likely going to be applying an amount of pressure that is going to be enough to give you those benefits. But certainly the Amazon booty bands I've seen on Instagram, people wearing them for a really long period of time. If, you, if anybody's done BFR, you're gonna understand that you want those cuffs off as soon as you possibly you know, you know possibly can. It's very uncomfortable, um, but that's again, a marker of how you know you're doing what you need to do in order to stimulate muscle growth. Um, but I don't necessarily advocate for those Amazon straps. I think that, um, that they're, they're cheap for a reason. And particularly, just think about this. You are manipulating your blood flow, okay? Why would you want to go cheap on that? Um, it, it just, it, it, it's one of those things where you just got to step back and you have to think, hey, um, I'm doing something that's really going to be, you know, impacting my physiology, at least in the short term. And yeah, it's largely very safe to use in a variety of different people. But what I want, I want to really risk my, you know, potential health, you know, health effects for using something that's 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, you know, those are the questions that I tend to tend to ask back to those people that are that are asking me for for those. I'd much rather spend a couple hundred bucks knowing that I'm getting a, a good product that is at least going to be a little bit wider and it's going to be able to apply a pressure that's going to actually restrict. Because if you apply 100 millimeters of mercury with a very small cup you will not get the same level of restriction as you're applying a cup that's three and a half to five inches long, um, which is what we kind of looked at for our analysis. And Nick, one last thing is that, you know, I, I don't want people to get the takeaway that we should be, be should only do VFR. I think it's, it's kind of important to understand that it, it has a time and a place and we, we, we can integrate it. Um, and you don't have to be exclusive. It's another tool in the toolbox that's very effective. Because uh, I know even yourself, I've, I've seen you, I've seen you uh, put up good numbers on your bench presses, you know, uh, well over 300 pounds on that, and you're not using BFR on those. But I've seen you also use BFR in other uh, methodologies. So uh, can, can you just briefly touch on that? Yeah, I think once we understand, and this is where, so this is, I guess, relevant to my online course, because I really want to take a principles-based approach to understanding BFR. Because we understand BFR through a principle-based approach, we're going to then understand how we can best apply it in practice. So if we take the notion that BFR works through traditional means in the sense that what's happening at the muscle fiber level is largely identical, whether you're lifting heavy weights or you're lifting light weights with fatigue, mind you, light weights without fatigue, it's a little bit different, but light weights with fatigue where we're not moving the weight very quickly, then we can pretty much slide BFR in whenever we want to create a high intensity stimulus for 
for ourselves. And I am much of the advocate that, you know, heavy lifting is always going to be the most efficient and it's going to confer the greatest physiological benefits to multiple different tissue types. Why would you then, if you can lift heavy, a vast, vast, vast majority of the time, spend more time lifting low load BFR, unless you want to just be that person in the gym that people are going to look at and ask questions for. Like my whole thing is it's efficient and relatively more tolerable. How do I know that? Because we actually did a meta-analysis looking at that. Because that's another important area that I'm interested in is high, heavy load strength training when we're doing it to fatigue, right? When we're exercising eight reps and we're going eight reps, you know, heavy eight reps, it's actually going to be more tolerable than doing low load exercise to failure, right? So when we get to that point, it's like you always have to ask yourself, why BFR? and going through the setup of that. Now, if you have aches and pains, like for example, for me, I'm working right now, I have some elbow issues um, that I'm kind of cranky. So I, I wanna keep up my high intensity strength training, but I'm doing targeted work on my wrist, uh, my uh, wrist flexion and extension and bicep curls two times out of the week. And I'm keeping up one time out of the week for heavier bicep curls so I can still get that stimulus but ultimately offload a little bit and kind of usher myself into recovery. But if we understand a principle-based approach to blood flow restriction, then you're gonna, you're gonna feel very comfortable with sliding BFR in here, sliding it out, taking it out, because you're, hey, I'm a little more efficient. And that's really what we spend a lot of time on in, uh, in the courses that I teach online, but also in, in the courses that I give to other physical therapists in the United States, as well as I'm very fortunate uh, to be teaching in Europe as well. So awesome. awesome. Thanks so much, Nick. That this was really uh, insightful. Uh, I think it gives us a lot to think about. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that we kind of deciphered some of the misinformation in, uh, that's out there, uh, you know, and how you can apply some of this research. Uh, I encourage others to, to read the article that Nick wrote. And, and actually, you can Google his name. And uh, he's, he's, he's written quite a few articles on BFR. Uh, so he's, he, know, he wrote a piece actually in our, in our bodybuilding um, uh, special edition uh, in 2020. Uh, they wrote an article on BFR training in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. Um, actually, Strength and Conditioning Journal, rather, by the NFPA. And there's a section specifically for it. You can use it for physique enhancement. And uh, it, it kind of covers some of the basic literature around there. So there's a lot of good information out there. And uh, uh, please, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Tony, have anything else to add? No. Uh, sorry for the audio, but thank you so much for for joining us today and your your expertise and insights on being yeah and uh, thank you for everyone watching and if anybody has any questions about anything that we didn't cover feel free to uh dm me on instagram that's probably the easiest way just because i'm more responsive there and i'd be happy to answer any questions point you in the right direction of you know other researchers if you're interested that i follow their work or you know you really want to take a deep dive into bfr um, I'd be happy to point to you some accessible papers that you can kind of dip your toe in and uh, before you just jump full, full blown in. For those of you who uh, back, we'll be posting any performance, please do so. You can also follow Dr. Roy at the HPM, is that right? Uh, that is correct. We'll have a link, uh, our link in bio to uh, Tony, I think you cut out again, but I think you're saying uh, follow any of the performance <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't do so. Uh, Nick, tell us your Instagram handle real quick. Yeah. The, the HPM, or they can follow the BFR pros as well. All right. Um, so, our, so, and then our course, our course, shameless plug, if you're interested, bfrtraining.com. We have a ton of areas of where I've been published and links to all those papers. And, you know, if you're watching this, uh, this podcast, this uh, Instagram live later, and you want a discount code, just DM me and I'll happily provide you one. And again, thank you all for the platform. And I hope to continue to help, you know, grow NASM in whatever way is required of me. Yeah. So. And uh, please follow us on NASM Performance. Uh, we, uh, we, we're we going to post this a little bit later. The, the recording will be up 
and then uh, please feel free to share. And thank you, Tony, for for having us. Uh, sorry we had that bad connection, but hey, we, we made it. We made it work today. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye. -bye.